Uh, welcome. Um, we are uh, set for the next session, which is titled on exploiting digital transactional platforms, enabling access at the bottom of pyramid. This session will focus on accessibility of digital transactional platforms and how these platforms can pave way to effective access of finance. More importantly, payments, social protection, and insurance to the most marginalized section and the last mile. I take this opportunity to welcome the moderator for the session, Priyanka Agarwal Chopra, COO and Managing Partner, Seed Investing, CIIE, I am Ahmedabad. Please. I would also like to invite uh, our distinguished panelists for this session, Ajay Kumar, Chief Sales Officer, FIA, Tech Services, Private Limited. Neeraj Maheshwari, Chief Executive Officer, M. Swast. Vinish Shah, Chief Business Officer, Kraft Silicon. And Sapan Parekh, Co-Founder, Legality. Thank you so much. I would uh, now request Priyanka to take the session forward. So good, good morning, everyone. Uh, that was a very long tea break. I hope you guys are officially refreshed after the previous session and uh, excited about what is going to unfold here. Uh, I am Priyanka Chopra from uh, I'm Ahmedabad CIIE. Uh, I want to start by thanking Access for having me here to moderate this very pertinent conversation along with a group of very distinguished panelists. Uh, by way of a quick introduction, at CIIE, we work across the entire early stage innovation continuum, uh, from incubating and accelerating promising ventures to providing them with seed and venture funding to fuel their growth. Uh, we also train and provide insights to founders to build their capabilities. So in short, we provide uh, promising founders at their earliest stages with everything they need to make a superlative impact. Uh, a few years ago, we also set up uh, the Bharat Inclusion Initiative platform to uh, nurture technology-enabled solutions that boost uh, financial inclusion of the underserved. Uh, under this initiative, uh, we have supported over 24 research studies trying to really understand what are the needs of the Bharat segment. These studies have generated over 50,000 data points on various aspects of financial inclusion. Uh, we have uh, incubated uh, five uh, promising disruptive early stage ideas. Uh, we have uh, accelerated over 55 inclusive fintechs uh, and invested in about seven odd uh, ready to scale uh, solutions. Uh, just to give you a quick context of today's discussion, uh, you know, it's no secret to us that India has made tremendous strides uh, in boosting inclusion of the underserved. And this has happened because of a variety of factors. You know, there's increasing digital penetration, uh, progressive governments, regulatory forbearance, uh, you know, young and connected population, and the presence of many ecosystem catalysts. Uh, over the past 10 years, we have enabled digital identity for over a billion individuals. We have provided uh, uh, no frills bank accounts to over 500 million people, provided access to affordable internet you know, to over 800 million people, and at the last count, I think the digital payments annual transaction volume exceeded 114 billion. Uh, what has been unique about India's story has been the creation of this massive population scale digital public infrastructure that has truly unleashed, unleashed innovation uh, and solutioning at scale and has helped India emerge as one of the most fertile and exciting digital finance ecosystems um, in the world today. Uh, so while we've made tremendous strides, uh, you know, there is still a long way to go, right? Uh, access to formal finance uh, and insurance, you know, we are still lagging behind. Uh, while there is growing momentum in digital payments, you know, this, uh, this revolution has not reached all segments of the population uh, evenly. Uh, there are, you know, women are still lagging behind, right? Both in terms of ownership of financial products and the usage of it. Uh, more women than men, men have dormant bank accounts. Uh, you know, very few, I mean, at least, you know, lesser women uh, than men have uh, transacted digitally or have accessed formal uh, credit and savings. 
rising cases of fraud and mis-selling also threaten to blunt the momentum of the digital finance revolution by eroding customer trust. Uh, so for today's conversation, I thought we can examine you know, some of these uh, questions and issues through the prism of uh, number one, you know, customers um, and their you know, unique needs, preferences and behaviors. Um, then move on to understanding the role of data in financial inclusion, uh, partnerships in you know, reaching some of these most promising solutions to the last mile. And finally, you know, no discussion can be complete without talking about uh, the regulatory landscape. Uh, you know, in our panel today, uh, we have a wide variety of experiences, expertise, backgrounds, business models, products, market segments. You know, so uh, I'm sure it will all uh, lead to very enriching discussions. Um, what I would like to do is request all of my uh, fellow panelists to take a few minutes to introduce themselves and also tell us, you know, what you, their organizations are doing in uh, enhancing access to finance at the last mile. Sapan, can we start with you? This is the problem of sitting next to the moderator. I have to start first. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, so I'm the co-founder and head of business at Legality. Uh, Legality today is helping 30 plus microfinance institutions and uh, 15 plus banks digitize the last mile of paperwork. Um, this includes uh, uh, designing the journey of how paper moves to the borrower, to the co-borrower, to the guarantor, uh, then back to the microfinance institution or to the bank, um, ensuring it's RBI compliant, ensuring it's uh, Ministry of IT compliant, ensuring very, uh, very topically it is uh, compliant to the new consent frameworks that we are listening to. Um, uh, that's what legality helps creating. So our core products are uh, digital signatures, digital stamping, uh, document workflow management systems. Uh, that's what we do. And uh, very happy to be here. Thank you so much. Hi, good morning, everyone. So my name is Vinish, and um, so I, I represent Kraft Silicon. So we are a 23-year-old organization, and uh, we are working with about 300 clients globally, uh, providing them the tech support or the tech solution uh, from the core perspective, right? So. So if you look at in the context of financial inclusion, we are talking about the loan origination application, uh, the collections module, delinquency management, or uh, uh, the core system, which is the core loan management system and all. And we continuously you know, uh, strive towards improving our, our journey you know, by bringing in the AI, ML, and few other uh, you know, areas of the projects where we are working on. Um, globally, I mean, um, uh, if you look at it, uh, we have got variety of other uh, service lines like core banking, mobile banking, agency banking, and all that. So that's for Latin America, Africa uh, segment. So in Asia alone, um, uh, we started our journey uh, with uh, Ujivan in 2005, and uh, proud to say that we are uh, still there as our you know uh, partner with them, and so are many other uh, clients. Today, we are supporting about 99 million borrowers on our platform in Asia only, about 12 billion US dollar of uh, loan portfolio that we are managing, and about 3.5 billion transactions is what we have done in the last calendar year. So that's a, you know, so, and so, but apart from that, this also brings a lot of responsibility on our shoulder in terms of uh, having a seamless uh, solution, uh, and then we continuously strive towards it. So thank you so much. Yeah, we'll continue the discussion. <coughs> Thank you, Pranka, and good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm co-founder and CEO of MSWAST. Uh, we are trying to solve the primary healthcare issues. Uh, so, you know, we started a journey close to like four years back or three years back, rather. Uh, you know, what we have started uh, solving the problem is first, uh, you know, uh, building the primary healthcare clinics for the rural and, and semi-urban population, right? And why we started doing it, why we identify the existing sub health centers were not having a doctors or the qualified nurses, you know, to, to cater to the rural and semi urban population. So eventually we started building those partnerships with microfinance institutions, SFBs, banks, cooperative, and eventually. And today, in the last three years, we have onboarded almost 7 million clients and we have uh, done more about 3.5 million doctor consultations, 35 lakh doctor consultations, uh, which also makes us the one of the largest. Uh, primary healthcare providers, and one of the topic which which uh, will come in Prenka also raised is 
the accessibility issues, how we are solving, we'll, we'll discuss during the session, how we are, you know, solving the health equity. Today, 60% of our customers are women, right? And they are using the consultations. We see around 15,000 patients every day, uh, 15 to 20,000 patients every day through our 2,500 physical touch points across the country. And majority of them are in the, you know, uh, panchayat level, block level, and the tehsil level. So that's what we are trying to do. Thank you. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ajay. I am the chief sales officer for FIA Global. So uh, FIA founded in 2012. It's a uh, global winning uh, award we have got, and uh, we have been incubated in MIT. So uh, we are uh, working towards the underserved and unbanked from last uh, 11 years or odd. odd. And uh, we could build about 89 million customers across the country with 30,000 banking agents. We cover 99% of the districts across the uh, India. Also, we have operations in Bangladesh and Nepal. Uh, we primarily into the financial sector, and we offer uh, Satchet products to the unbanked and unserved, especially the customers which are not served. The financial products are not available in the uh, rural markets like Tier 3, Tier 4, and 5 and below. So uh, we have been uh, working with uh, 50 plus uh, uh, financial partners and that has helped us in terms of you know uh, reaching out to all these uh, markets and uh, helping the customers to avail the financial products. So that's what we have been doing and uh, we are uh, expanding our uh, operations. Uh, we are uh, uh, working with uh, pri private sector banks also now. Uh, we have partnered with HDFC as well. So we are on the uh, on the expansion spree, and also we'll be we would be like to offering our uh, own lending solutions to the customers which are available, especially into the MSME uh, segment where the need is uh, very much there, uh, especially in the rural markets. So that's what uh, about us. Thank you. So thank you uh, for all those introductions. Uh, as discussed, I'd like to start with a deep dive on the customer first. And Neeraj, uh, you know, given that you are the sole, you know, healthcare flag bearer on the panel, uh, let's start with you. Uh, so from a health services perspective, especially given the low insurance penetration, you know, in these customer segments, what are the needs and behaviors of these uh, segments? And what kind of insurance products and messaging have you seen work? Uh, I would also like to request you to perhaps share some examples of product innovations that you have done to cater to these segments. Right. So let me just, uh, you know, step back in our journey where we started and, uh, you know, uh, probably, you know, <coughs> after looking at a lot of models and I spent about, you know, 13 years in insurance, you know, we just wanted to go and offer, you know, very standard product, which was initially when we started, we started talking about a telemedicine product, right? And initially, let me share with a very honest feed feedback with you. Uh, you know, we enrolled roughly 70,000 customers. So we started with Cashpur Microcredit, which is an MFI, you know, operating in the North India, largely North India. Out of 70,000, not even 10% contacted us, right? And we, we realized, what is the challenge? You know, how are we going to solve it? And that's where we look at it, you know, when we talk about a rural, you know, I'll touch upon the government-led services as well, but you need to have an assisted model, right? So that's where, you know, we learned, you know, how you customize because you know to you need to address the core challenges. You know, the challenges are, you know, we, we call it the four A principle, which is, you know, afford affordability, accessibility, you know, talk about awareness and uh, and uh, you know uh, acceptability. So if you look at the customer point of view, you know, uh, how to create an awareness? If they do not have an awareness, they have a low you know, utilization of the product. And if you have a low utilization on the product, the product will eventually die down, right? Uh, and is it an affordable where they is, can, is, uh, can it fit in the, to their pockets? You know, uh, you know, how you reach out to them and gra gradually, you know, as a healthcare in institution, we need, we had figured out, I think much earlier, if you don't have an on-ground presence, you will not be able to serve them. And that's where we started working our partnerships, through our partnerships, that we start to having build a clinic, so, uh, physical clinics, which is a brick and mortar. You know, we requested our MFI partners if they can give us a space or we build our own, right? And some of we started talking to some of the BC partner like FIA. Uh, can we like set up the infra next to your branches 
if you can get an excess. So what we've really, really figured out is that the touch point is critical. Uh, you know, uh, especially in the, uh, do you, if you ask me in the long run or the short run, I would say in the long run as well. Short run is very much needed. Once you educate them through on ground, you know, they are walking somewhere, they, they need assistance, you know, uh, and you are giving them the right solution and you keep building a solution. When we started, we are doing pure telemedicine, we started doing the in-person per consultation, then we started keeping the basic medicine at the clinic, and then we started referring to the hospital and the, you know, a lot of healthcare services which you can in include. But it has to start somewhere is in the building the presence. And that's a product innovation we do, we did. And, and just, uh, and I want to share with you, being on the ground or the, or the having a physical presence doesn't mean you can't be digitized, right? Our, com our journey is completely paperless. We do it everything on mobile. Yes, we do it on a smartphone as well as the feature phone. Uh, majority of the customer, what I, uh, you know, you might see the different data on the smartphone, uh, smartphone users and all. What we have really experienced, they don't use their phone. You know, at times they don't pick up their phone, right? So you need to really something where they can walk in. And yes, you can create awareness. You don't have to come all the way. You don't have to spend money to use the service. You can use it from home. So those are the differences you can make. And I've been closely, we have been working with the insurance companies also, also that, you know, why you are asking the customer to fill up a form, right? When you can simply send a document on the WhatsApp, you know, how can you send the hospital and why, why they're filling up the long form when you have already got an active policy number, right? So talk to a TPA. They don't need to come up with the form. If they have a valid ID, Aadhaar card or whatever documentation, they should get an hospital admission. So those are the things which we are trying to change. There are a lot of, I think I can go on endless talking. So I want to share the experience or learn experience from others as well. So these are the product innovation probably everyone want to look at it, how we can evolve. Thank you. Thank you, Neeraj. Um, moving on to you, Vinish, next. Uh, you know, as a technology service provider to MFIs and SFBs, you know, across the length and breadth of the country, yeah. um, you know, I really wanted to understand, you know, your observations on, uh, you know, the much talked about urban versus rural divide. Do you see uh, differences even across different geographies, you know, sectors in India? Uh, you know, what are some of the lessons that, you know, you have learned that some of the entrepreneurs in the room can possibly take with them? And just building on to Neeraj's point, also wanted your take on the physical strategy and is it here to stay? Okay. Okay. So let me start with the physical first. Okay. So now if you look at from a physical perspective, which is physical and digital or other what we call as in high touch, high touch and high tech. tech, you know, so I, I don't think so. It's going to go anywhere for at least next 10 years. That's been our observation slowly and gradually. Uh, till the time, you know, our generation moves in terms of the women borrowers, specifically when we are talking from an MFI perspective, right? So unless until that gets evolved, it's going to stay. However, what we are seeing is that definitely there is a rise in terms of the usage of digital channel at the end borrower level as well. Okay. Uh, I'll give you one example. So um, just about, um, you know, couple of years back, we launched an uh, end borrower application, which was initially only a reactive application that a lot of people adopted, wherein a borrower can look at their loan card, they can, you know, uh, we can educate them on the uh, loan repayment, uh, digital loan repayments and all that. And we saw it in a very good, uh, this thing, specifically during the time of COVID, you know, so a lot of people were actually using it to do the loan repayment. But now, interestingly, with that success, because earlier we were very, very skeptical. So with one of the small finance bank, we recently launched like about five months back, a self onboarding application. Now, when we are talking about the self onboarding application here, the entire journey. So if you look at right from the lead generation to aligning themselves into a group, their CGT, GRT, pretty much end to end journey, except for the contact point verification, wherein somebody is going and doing the house visit. Everything end to end is on um, digital platform. Okay, uh, the saving a lot of time. There is a lot of uh, overhead saving, and now uh, we have seen that one of the biggest uh, MFI in the country uh, has asked us to replicate the model, and so is some of the other small finance bank. So it's going to go. Definitely, it would be on rise, right? Now coming to the uh, divide. So now definitely, uh, if you look at it. 
based on our observation, uh, the adoption, even if you look at, let's say, for example, some of the MFIs who are specifically operating in southern India has seen probably much more success in terms of digital loan repayment through mobile channel than compared with uh, maybe East, for that matter. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the awareness and the, even the penetration from a smartphone perspective, even if it is not there in terms of per individual, it is at least very, very high when we look at it from a per family perspective. So they might not be using their registered mobile number, but they would be having some smartphone in the family to, you know, so that's on the rise, it's a huge number jump that we have seen. So definitely there is a, there's a big divide, you know, um, if you compare West versus East or North versus South in terms of the uh, general digital awareness, digital literacy, there's definitely a, a, a big gap that we observe. And even for the matter of when we look at the data uh, from a data maturity point of view. So some regions have got much more mature data um, and that helps us towards moving not just relying on the credit bureau information or the KYC information, but also to start looking at the alternate data. Uh, but the experiment largely are successful only in given geography, but not everywhere uh, across India. So I think there is there's a lot of work to be done, um, especially when you look at states like, for example, Assam or, or uh, West Bengal, Bihar, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh. So, so definitely there are there are these areas where where we need to uh, work towards you know digital literacy now if you compare it with some of the states in southern india so that's a completely different story sure, sure. yeah thank you thank ajay you. if we can just move to you next you know we've briefly touched upon health services and behaviors around health services touched upon credit uh, i'd like to understand from a pr global perspective uh, how are uh, the wealth product needs of the low income segments you know different from other segments um, and you know, for again, a lot of people are looking to see if they can build you know wealth tech uh, for the bottom of the pyramid. Any challenges, opportunities from your perspective that you can share with them? Yeah, the, that is very much uh, in in our radar, and also we are working towards that. So wealth management is uh, uh, one area where, especially when it comes to the uh, tier three and below markets, right? So the availability. And, uh, and accessibility also is an issue and awareness as well, right? So we are educating uh, uh, through our uh, BC network, uh, which is available across the country on uh, wealth management services. Like, uh, you know, uh, we, we promote the FDs, RDs through our BC network. So that, that is helping the customers to do the savings, etc. Also, you know, we have uh, started the uh, mutual funds, which is actually giving a good results uh, in terms of the rural markets, while a lot of time it will take in terms of, you know, uh, creating the awareness, etc. But uh, but if you look at the uh, DPI, which is available for us, but uh, that is that will not help in terms of uh, a, an individual requirement. But however, if you uh, if you see the current trend, which uh, AEPS, which is a, a technology which is being used, uh, through that, I think uh, we can uh, we can develop uh, an individual need, right? So that is something which uh, which need to be work on. I mean, which uh, which is a very good opportunity which is available because AEPS transactions are catching up like anything. Uh, that is the digital movement which is happening across the country. Through that, you know, we can analyze the data of the customers and we can see that you know what kind of uh, requirements are there, uh, which can be tailor made to the. Uh, maybe the uh, age wise or the uh, category wise you know uh, income group or the kind of uh, nature of work what they do basis that we can offer uh, very uh, uh, very tailor made uh, uh, products so that's the opportunity i see uh, even uh, even even you know uh, in the sectors where uh, 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 if you look at the uh, urban side also that that uh, opportunity is still available because metros are largely you know uh, highly educated people and they understand the investments etc and all but uh, semi urban up to some extent and urban and especially in the rural so this is an opportunity which is available so in terms of the data capturing i think the aps is the aps is the biggest opportunity which is available uh, thanks to the government, which they are also been pushing on this digital transactions, etc. So that's the area I think uh, fintechs or uh, you know uh, the uh, companies uh, can work upon and uh, bring in some good amount of solutions so that you know everyone will be able to access to the tailor-made solutions. Thank you, Ajay. Uh, coming to you next, Apan. 
Um, so businesses face many challenges, ranging from limited digital infrastructure to digital illiteracy, mistrust in digital transactions on the path to becoming truly digital. Uh, what are some of the things that legality is doing to make your interfaces more accessible to the low-income customer? And also, you know, are you attempting to tackle any issues around fraud and consent, you know, in your solutions to your partners? Got it. Okay. So, um, I'll first touch upon the operational aspect of it. Uh, then we can move to the accessibility and I think the third aspect is in terms of fraud. So quite quite uh, a lot of ground to cover. Uh, the, the most important thing that comes in the mind of a microfinance institution operationally is the cost of running the operations, right? So I think, um, I think everybody, uh, at least in the Sadhan event um, yesterday, everybody keeps saying what can we do to reduce the operational cost because it after all benefits the borrowers. They don't want to be paying increasing interest rates, uh, which is where the risk adjusted interest rate regime also come in from RBI where you can charge different interest rates basis the risk, right? Similarly, if operationally, if you can reduce the interest rates, nothing like it, right? So a solution like legality, which helps you digitally manage and today 30 MFIs are using us, which also means 30 others are not using us, right? In terms of reducing their operational costs. What we have seen, if you move from physical to digital and the right digital method, it doesn't mean uh, all digital methods is the same. Uh, the right digital method, which is both accessible, uh, which prevents fraud, at the same time it solves the problem, that is key to reduce operational cost. We've seen several cases where um, microfinance institutions or banks have, uh, have kind of adopted some digital methods, but either it's not compliant or it's not accessible or it doesn't cater to all the fraud scenarios that's possible, right? So what is very key is in order to reduce operational costs, in order to make it accessible, you need the right digital tools. Um, uh, for example, just to give some numbers, we have in the last few years done two crore microfinance transaction, right? Which, which doesn't necessarily mean only for MFIs, but even for small finance banks and banks, we've done two crore such transactions. Effectively, we've removed maybe 10 crore paper pages from the system, uh, which has helped them save ballpark of 100 to 200 crores operational cost, right? These are the numbers that we hear from the clients that we've saved them uh, X, Y, Z amount of money. Um, and more critically, when you remove paper from the process, uh, including what Neeraj was talking about, that he has a paperless journey, when you remove paper from the process, your on-field agents also, their lives improve. Today we see the attrition rates uh, in this segment from 40 to 50%, right? If it makes the life of the end agent harder, where they have to do the paperwork again, they have to spend 20 minutes engaging with a customer which can be pre-populated or which can be digitized and they can do it in five minutes, you are actually improving their life at workplace, right? So that is one aspect which uh, was, was mentioned by the RBI that we need to think of ways in which we can reduce uh, the, the, the burden on the agents which will improve the efficiency at the same time reduce cost and improve the customer experience as well, right? So that's on the operational aspect. In terms of accessibility, I think with the new uh, data protection regime coming in, uh, while the rules are weighted, with the new regime coming in, what was earlier considered as optional in, in the non-regulated space, regulated space, I think there was a lot of uh, push towards making it accessible, but on the non-regulated space, it was not really mandated. Now it's a mandate across board, which means it has to be accessible in terms of people should be able to consent in and consent out. People should be able to understand what they're consenting to, right? So these are the some of the key aspects. Uh, at Legality, we from day one, uh, while serving this segment, have ensured that uh, whatever consent they're giving, they're actually not giving consent in English, right? That's been sort of a folly of some of these digital applications and digital journeys. We have always run it in English. Uh, in the last couple of years, we've seen multilingual flows coming in um, uh, and, and that has been great, right? Now uh, it's a mandate uh, going forward, right? So legality has been at the forefront of ensuring that across all our states, local language flows get accepted. Uh, borrowers understand what they are consenting to, borrowers understand what they are uh, uh, onboarding with. Uh, so that's been a key uh, linchpin of making it accessible. Um, and, and in terms of fraud, I think uh, a lot has been done, but a lot more has to be done. Uh, both RBI, ministry, they keep coming up with new uh, methods and new areas of concern, uh, which all service providers like us 
try uh, catering to, including UIDI, for example, has come up with new set of biometric regulations. UIDI has come up with phase-based authentication to remove the <laughs> gaps in the fingerprint uh, detection system. So while at the regulatory level, a lot of action is happening, at the service provider level, we need to ensure that we cater solutions which uh, adopt uh, what's available publicly, at the same time build on top. To take an example, uh, let's say you are doing a digital signature, let's say Vinish Shah is the one who is the borrower who's signing the document. You need to ensure that Vinish is the one who's actually using his Aadhaar to uh, sign the document. It's not either by mistake or deliberately, he's not using his partner's uh, Aadhaar details or, or his brother's Aadhaar details because a lot of times mm -hmm. almost uh, the parameters, the images may match, but actually it's not the person, right? Or, or for example, we've also heard of cases where the Aadhaar itself is fraudulent. So legality has built systems which ensures that if Vinish Shah is the one taking the loan, we can accurately uh, identify that he's the one who's getting the loan uh, at the same time, right? And of course, there are some uh, more nuances around it, uh, which, which we can discuss going forward. Got it, yeah. So, uh, you know, on the subject of customer, uh, you know, women continue to be the largest block of uh, underserved segment uh, by formal finance. Ajay, I want to come back to you. And uh, if you can help us understand what Fiat Global has specifically done to bring access to finance to women. Okay, so uh, getting finance for the women is a uh, challenge as we know. So, <coughs> What we have done in uh, uh, pre-COVID, which is 1920, so that's the time you know, we started working on this. And uh, uh, first thing we have realized that you know the mobility uh, for a woman is uh, important in the rural areas, right? So we we started uh, pushing you know um, the loans for the two-wheelers, and uh, that we have helped them through the SSG model, right? One is that we have done. Second thing is, as a BC network, if we see, uh, we our uh, almost 38 percent of the BCs are women. So that way, you know, uh, again, it is helping them in terms of you know uh, reaching out to the end users there and also the connecting to the uh, women customers, which will be accessible, will be very uh, easy for them, and also the SSG members, uh, which which uh, which are onboarded. So they are like mobile. They they move to villages. They move, meet the customers there, and they take the applications of loans and etc. and all, and they further coordinate with the banks, and they start uh, getting the sanctions for them. So we have also built a model on uh, financial resilience, especially for the women's. You know, so that will uh, help in terms of you know building their uh, net, uh, net worth as well, as well as the portfolio. Uh, uh, becomes for them because you know uh, accessing credit is a big challenge there because they won't be having any existing credit uh, uh, you know uh, civil reports etc because they do not have any access to the current finances right so that's how we are uh, keenly working on that and we have built this model and it has been successful uh, from last uh, three years we have been doing this and uh, we are uh, uh, with uh, especially we are uh, working with the RRBs on this uh, particular model because they are the close to the customers across the country so that way we sh we could uh, uh, onboard many of the women uh, customers into the uh, loans which uh, they can access to so especially on the two-wheeler front side we have done a lot of uh, disbursements on this so moving on to data next, you know, increasing digitization has led to rapid growth in data trails, uh, which has significantly enhanced the movement towards financial inclusion. Uh, I want to come back to you, Sapan. Uh, you know, you alluded to the DPDP Act. Uh, and I want to understand, uh, you know, if what you think are going to be the implications of this act on fintechs and financial inclusion. Right, so um, DPDP rules are awaited. So while uh, real implementation is awaited because that's what will tell us how to constitute the board, rules, compliances, frameworks, and assessments, um, if you've not started thinking about it, you are late, right? In terms of uh, actually putting uh, people and processes in place, that should have already started, right? The two, uh, the two key pillars of DPDP Act, as I understand it, uh, uh, not to be a lawyer on this panel, but as I understand it, uh, one is data minimization, right? So for the longest time, uh, all data processes have been collecting more and more data, ingesting more data, building on top of these data parameters. 
uh, uh, what now needs to happen is you need to minimize the amount of data you hold, which is very, very critical because the more data you hold, the more vulnerable you get, right? right? So that's key. Second is data consent. Um, so you need to ensure that consent, which earlier was behind uh, two links and was a two, uh, 40 pager in English language, can't be behind two links and can't be behind uh, uh, a language which the customer does not understand. It needs to be clear. It needs to uh, be obvious that this is the consent the person is giving and it needs to be specific, right? It can't be consent for anything and everything, right? So it impacts how cross-selling happens. It will impact how data processing happens and uh, whether data transfer happens, right? So it's a sort of a corollary to what we've seen happening in Europe and US and, uh, and, and India has now landed in the, in, in the broader uh, global uh, regime of protecting data, minimizing data. Uh, so, so people need to start thinking about it very actively. You need to get your legal and compliance teams uh, sort of uh, updated on what can be done. So these are the two sort of key aspects broadly. Thank you. So I hope there's nobody in the audience that is already too late. <laughs> We're all <laughs> thinking about our uh, DPDP strategy. Right. Just, uh, just to add one more thing, Priyanka, in this, uh, another sort of thing that has now come in is uh, the new concept of consent manager, uh, where every consent that is captured, uh, the customer should be able to manage the consent that's given. Uh, uh, while, like, while it looks like people have been doing it for the longest time, but it's something uh, that is now going to be regulated, right? Which means there is an opportunity uh, for service providers like legality to build something which is very compliant, which is very robust, and which is sort of up to date. Uh, so legality, like I'm happy to share, that has been thinking about building and working with several stakeholders on a consent framework uh, service, uh, and happy to sort of uh, uh, share more details offline with people who may be interested, but that's something that we actively need to start thinking about, because if you've not started, you're late, as, <laughs> as I was just saying. <laughs> Thank you for underlining that, Sapan, again. Uh, Vinish, I want to come to you next. Uh, how are you leveraging data to reduce incidences of fraud uh, you know, with the MFIs and SSDs that you support. Okay, so <coughs> so if you look at from a fraud perspective, right? I mean, so there are there are there are two sides of it. So one is what is happening towards the loan origination. So when I say loan origination, you know, in terms of the identity fraud, you know, somebody mentioned about you know, uh, like Sapan said, uh, Aadhaar. You know, people can use a similar name Aadhaar or similar looking, and and um, we came across a case wherein the field officers were coordinating among themselves to find somebody named by Savita who has got better uh, this thing. So so there have been cases like that wherein people have done. So it can be Savita Kumari, Savita K, something else. So it can be mix and match of various permutation combinations. So that's towards the identity. And then the application fraud in terms of, you know, giving the um, inaccurate information, you know, specifically when we are talking about uh, with the new regulation about 3 lakh of the income and 1.5 lakh of expense and all that thing. So so people are giving the uh, wrong information in order to get it or even uh, the very definition of the household itself is a is a question mark right now. But that's one. Second one is what is happening inside. So inside fraud, you know, wherein the uh, data is misrepresented or uh, the numbers are not correctly reported or it can be few other things right so <clears throat> the only way i think uh, for for the loan origination stage to mitigate this risk is to have a very very robust uh, validations in place you know so you there are apis available there are services available we just need to have the right combination of them to be deployed not not to overdo the cost of application but still like for example, there is a Zosia, there is name match, there is, you know, uh, I mean, even if uh, people don't have the KUA or sub KUA thing for the EKYC, you can still go ahead and do it a lot of other ways to, you know, mitigate that. And then using an LMS system, which is so tightly, uh, uh, you know, uh, packed that you practically cannot do anything within the application or within the core. If you have to do it, you have to do it outside the system. You just cannot. And if if you want to do it, then definitely there is maker checker, there is consent piece, yeah. there is uh, uh, you know uh, we can say the audit trails are maintained, uh, and each and every data point is captured um, to an extent that 
whatever you're doing, it's, it's everything is visible transparently. Um, I think that's how we are going to solve it. Otherwise, there is no other way, um, you know, to go about it. Neeraj, coming to you now. Uh, you've set up several health clinics in partnership with MF5 as we were talking. Uh, can you throw some light on how health data can be leveraged to enhance uh, access to financial services and vice versa? There's a reverse data flow that you can use to deepen your penetration of healthcare. So yes, uh, definitely. So currently we work, as I told you, we have got access to about 7 million customers. What we're also getting is the family data, right? So, uh, you know, yeah, the, our solution is the family solutions, right? Uh, the customers, the, the women customers living in Bihar, you know, the family within Bihar or the, you know, husband who have migrated to other state, we get all the data. Those, whoever is consulting and utilizing the solution. The one, one of the things which we are helping even MFIs and which we offer to them, you know, they have a huge issue of contactability, right? Where the customer is changing the mobile phone, but with our health solution, they have to update their number, right? If they don't, so at time they, they have registered, they've got different registered number, but they call from the, so one is updating the number. That's I think will help a lot to the MFI. Second is we kind of use the similar data. You know, you can you can design a lot of, uh, you know, with our product, we know what kind of disease patterns in states. We know what kind of age brackets, what kind of product we are utilizing. We can focus on, you know, also the, the microfinance institution. We have said, okay, why don't you come up with a health financing solution, right? One of the biggest segment, which could be. Today, if you look at it, you know, the, the 70 to 80 person, people in rural, they end up using the, uh, you know, their savings for the, and out of 20 person health, end up borrowing for the health, right? Which is again, a very massive data, which we can provide. And there's a, and what we can do is because, you know, they are coming to the first time to us, you know, for the health problems, we can, we can tell our MFI partner, yes, they're the genuine ones, right? They're not just creating the stories and giving you the false information. They need the money for the genuine health purpose. And when they when you give them the money in the need, I'm sure they're gonna return to you as well. Yeah. So there are a couple of things probably, and the data which we get, they're largely the, we use the similar data what they are collecting for the, so we collect the data for the member and his spouse, and then we keep on adding the data for their family member, which could be kid, which could be the dependents, and all those things. Thank you, Neeraj. Uh, Ajay, I know that data has been a key focus for FIA Global since your inception in 2012. Uh, how did you design your data strategy in the early days, you know, before the advent of uh, DPI uh, and Jantan accounts, right? And what kind of data did you collect? How did you collect it? What did you use it for? Yeah, that's a <coughs> good question because uh, before the DPI, it is all uh, manual, right? So we didn't have any information on uh, how the where the customers, etc., are there. So to, to cater and expand our uh, banking partners, so we have used the uh, census data because that is one of the key information which was available for us. And that's how, uh, if you look at the other industries also like telecom, et cetera, and all. So they have also utilized the similar kind of data. So we have adopted the same and we have, uh, we have looked at the population's data. Uh, and basis that, we have suggested the banks to go and do the expansion, right? So. That's how we have built our distribution, which is the with the help of our uh, feed on street network. So, which is the largest network what we have in the country now. So, that's uh, that was a key uh, point for us in terms of you know going to the which market, which kind of a village we need to set up the uh, point, and what kind of a services we need to provide. Then further, we used to go to the banks, and uh, because banks do have their uh, geography in terms of you know which has to be nearest to the branches serviceable area so we did the, all those mapping on our own and then we went to the banks and suggested them these are the areas i think potential is there and which are close to the branches as well so then we started uh, giving this directions to our uh, team which is on the ground feet on street so that has helped us in terms of you know building the networks so after that you know we started collecting the information what kind of a customer uh, uh, transactions are happening, what kind of a deposits they are doing and uh, withdrawals they are doing. Basis that we started pushing the FDRD products, which are the basic product which is available with any banker. So that is how we managed. So moving on to partnerships now, if there's one thing that we've learned uh, while working with you know over 60 early stage fintechs, is that the right kind of collaborations and partnerships to access you know large customer segments is probably the single largest determinant of scale. So, uh, you know, Neeraj, you've uh, 
you've uh, set up a very successful partnership you know with a variety of stakeholders so what are some of the elements from your perspective in building a successful business model in partnership with you know different stakeholders like the government you know medical businesses insurance uh, creators so on and so forth i think we, we probably with the with the channel like us and probably i think everyone uh, the partnership is is a way forward right so we are uh, you know serving a customer which where we charge them 365 rupees a year for the solution for their family right now if i go and go with the d2c strategy which is much popular in shark tank and as well as the start of world you know they everybody wants to run about the behind the d2c model right my problem is if you have in the channels you know banking everything which put together gives you access to 80 90 crore customer base right by sharing some bit of our revenue and which also complement right so one is the i'll come to the distribution and then i'll come to the other channel so the, you have a right there the distribution channel which can take you to the rural any part of the country at no uh, right time so like legality uh, you know he was discussing the partnership similarly we have built about 35 partnerships and we see the opportunities you know building to 300 partnerships 400 partnerships in a year and you know today just to give you an example the kind of a scale we can get you know we we almost got operational after covid and we have access to about 30 3 and 1/2 crore customers already right we have cracked about 7 million customers so far because we are doing cross selling up selling to those customers on the other side similar way you know i would have got into designing my own solution we started building partnership with an insurance company right why don't you we can club the product of yours you building your 2500 touch points and i'm sure you never do that the insurance company you know their infrastructure we know we have a brick and mortar model you know we can set up a small shop and we can start serving the customers so we we now went to the insurance company similarly similarly we went on to hospitals similarly we went on to okay we'll send you the patient you know obviously why don't you give us the better rate and obviously you want to you know identify the good ones and the bad ones so you go with the good ones and of course you know now we are getting to the diagnostic we are where we are you know negotiating the price for the customer if they want to get a diagnostic services today they they pay around 700 800 for a minimal test why we are negotiating the b2b price for the customer right we can get a b2b price and trust me we are being very very fair to the customer you know how we can give a test at 50 60% discount similarly we started keeping the medicines we are directly buying from the manufacturing companies manufacturers you know of the medicine providing today uh, you know at a clinics we uh, just give you a small example we cover the pregnancy supplement kit right which costs them about you know at the customer if they go to the market it costs them about 700 right and i'm i'm here sharing the secret of the business it doesn't even cost us 70 rupees right so we 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 were uh, you know we were prescribing those medicines earlier and we realized they were not taking it because the cost seven they cannot spend 700 rupees on the pregnancy supplements at immediate cost so we were we made it a part of the package so they're similar and now the government also you know uh, if you're going to ask the next question aishman bharat it's a huge complimentary channel to us you know uh, you know we'll talk about that in the next probably question and but the way we want to cover it is you know you have government has got a you know some sort of setup how we can leverage it right similar uh, we call as a health and wellness center or whatever so we there's enough opportunity and we when you build partnership you're leveraging on infra you're leveraging on the customer acquisition you're leveraging on the services you don't have to build everything your own you can buy and you can affordably build it that's my belief is thank you neeraj uh, vinish i know that you feel very strongly about intra industry collaborations i wanted to understand from your perspective you know how is collaboration between regtech paytech you know other technology service providers helping the financial inclusion initiative okay so let's set the context you know just go back like 5 years okay so um so pehle kaise hota tha you know you have like okay you have the credit bureau you have maybe an id validation <laughs> partner and that's about it right so and and you all you need is a los lms system to originate the loan to acquire the customer and manage the loan that that was the basic thing that was required there were that's all was need to have kind of thing rest everything was good to have you know good to have in terms of the bank um, account check or few other check they were all good to have okay now the good to haves have converted and became need to have 
Okay. Now, what is happening is today, if you look at even in microfinance or MSME, any of these loan originations, so you need to have the proper KYC validations. You need to do a penny drop to account, you know, bank account verification. You need to have uh, alerts to be sent. You need to have e-signs to be done. So there, there are so many things where so many service providers have come in play. Now, what is happening with a financial institution? One. He has to worry about, they have to worry about a good LOS, LMS system. They also have to find partners for all these various services like uh, voter ID, Aadhaar, EKYC, you know, there is uh, Sarsai integration. There's so many of them, right? Correct? Now, how about, you know, uh, we collaborate and should be able to offer an ecosystem so that clients don't have to worry about this basic hygiene, which I call now a basic hygiene. Right. So what we have done as, as a, you know, as Crowd Silicon, so we went ahead, we evaluated the partners in the market uh, and we onboarded them as, as our pre-integrated solution. So how it is helping? So one, it is helping that clients don't have to worry about finding the partner. We, are, we have got best partners in the market as pre-integrated. It is saving cost uh, and the time uh, in terms of the efforts that going into the integration. So it's because it is pre-integrated, clients just have to do a direct engagement, say, with legality. Uh, and once they agree on the commercials, their contract and all, clients just tell us to activate or to enable it. And from the back, we just enable it and the legality is on board. We don't have to do anything practically. Uh, so it's not that, that we are rigid, but we, I mean, client can also suggest that you can go with this partner or that partner, but we proactively offer them, we kind of bundle it to them uh, that you can get in touch with this. Uh, for example, our friend over here, Neil, you know, Neil is sitting. So we have we have done the pre-integration with Awaz Day, because now if you look at for with the new guideline recovery and all that, you need to have the vernacular alerts sent. Um, you need to have uh, uh, you know built in as a part of the uh, part and parcel of the mobility itself, right? So likewise, so that's why I'm saying it, it has to be a collaborated effort. It's not only going to mitigate your frauds, it's going to bring in efficiency, going to save a lot, lot of cost, a lot of effort. And I think that's the way to go about it. Sure. So uh, coming to the final segment in non-regulations, uh, like I had mentioned, no discussion on financial services can be complete without talking about the role of regulations. Uh, you know, and anybody on the panel, you know, if they'd like to share their thoughts on what do they think has been the impact of the very dynamic uh, regulatory landscape uh, in the country vis-a-vis -vis its impact on financial inclusion. See, as far as the regulatory uh, concern, I can talk about the insurance side or the, you know, or the health side. Uh, you know, what we have seen is the regulations which have been in the market, they've been primarily very, very supportive. You know, in last, I would say, especially in last two decades, right? They've been very supportive in terms of reaching out to masses. There are a lot of easiness in terms of acquiring the customers, servicing the customer. You know, you can today digitally serve the whole journey of the customers. But I also believe there's a lot more to be done, right? Still, you know, uh, I would, I would, I don't know, I should mention it or not. We see a lot of restrictions from the RBI side. I'm sure they are good for the customers, but let's say if I have to distribute a health services product, you know, there are a lot of that, you know, you can't distribute from the same premises, from a bank premise, you know, while you can do it, right? So if you can do an insurance product, and similarly health is a kind of, a, in US, you know, most of the bank, they distribute almost like today, almost any other product, including the financial and the non financial services, right? I'm sure there is a you know thin line or the silver lining on what kind of product you can do. So that's where somewhere we need to, and now when you're talking about the partnership, it's very much linked to the regulations, right? You can do some, like today, we can refer to the customer to a hospital, but we can't earn anything out of it, right? I'm not saying it's a good thing or bad thing, I'm sure it's safe, serve the, but there has to be an incentive for each and every player when they are going to, like today, if I don't share any, Revenue with any small revenue with a distribution partner, why they'll be interested, right? So those are the things the regulation need to be evolved when you have a multilateral partnerships going all around, you know, how they can support each other. Probably that's something which we need to look at it very, very carefully. And I'm sure, uh, you know, look at the existing infrastructure, which is being unutilized, right? Today, you can't use a sub-health center going together. Why, why not uh, MFI? 
can go and acquire customer those at several centers or the or the panchayat level right which is easily access available why you need to create your own infra at every panchayat level block level tehsil level there is an existing infra and the, the goal if obviously we collaborate with the government it will be not easy right any individual player if as an industry we go and collaborate with the government i'm sure we can do a lot more thank you anybody else has uh, anything to add uh, contrary opinions uh, i i would say that you know from a, a regulatory perspective i think uh, working with so many customers across the globe uh, in so many different countries i think uh, we have one of the most uh, or i won't say stringent but a very strong regulatory body um and that has contributed a lot towards the success of where we stand at this point of time okay even if you look at uh, the regulatory changes as far as the microfinance guideline is concerned which was given on what last year 14th march right um it has opened a completely new door what a lot of new possibility to a lot of people and i'm pretty sure they are going to revise the the uh, threshold value from 3 to maybe more or something like that maybe in the near future um because industry has seen some rejection rates i mean the rejections have gone up drastically when you tag it as a group loan uh, kind of thing uh but over a period of time i think uh, this is going to serve really well and because of that uh, the uh, uh, you know the, the ability to serve so that we don't have again in the future something like what happened like andhra crisis right uh we can avoid something like that uh and, and that's the whole reason why this is there and i think it's being very supportive uh not only from uh, from the uh, this thing but also from a validation perspective customer onboarding perspective the kind of checks and balances you need to deploy i think they've been very very supportive so i think it's all positive uh yeah flexibility probably yes is required uh timeline probably yes is required you know you cannot be like uh, giving the new regulation on 14th march and expect to to start it from 1st april uh, it's not going to happen technologically it is not possible practically it is not possible from operation perspective and they have been flexible to extend you know even if you look at the like the npa or the provisioning or those kind of things i think they have been flexible to extend the timelines as well so i think yeah thank you and in the interest of time now we'd like to open up the floor uh, for the audience to ask questions to any of the panelists yeah that's a good point uh, as you rightly mentioned that you know whatever the money they are earning today uh, might not be enough for any kind of saving right but however uh, if we look at uh, the savings are critical for any uh, any person uh, so hence we are building a model on financial uh, resilience right that's what uh, uh, we are working on now because uh, every age you need a different requirement correct so uh, maybe at a childhood uh, stage you need a requirement of uh, education etc and all then after that marriage then kids etc and all then after that the retirement so we are uh, uh, the kind of information which we have with the help of uh, ai which we have uh, uh, we have built in within our own systems right so we are working out a, on a model where financial resilience will be built right so that you know we will suggest the customers right of course they might not have a 
uh, huge uh, money to save but uh, the some amount of portion which we would like to suggest them that kind of uh, which will help them in terms of you know uh, with the respect to the age bracket that will help them in terms of you know building some amount of uh, uh, savings so that's a model which we are uh, already working on which is what our uh, financial inclusion to we are now moving to the financial resilience so that's the stage we are because if you look at uh, as a country we have 50 crore plus jandan accounts right so i think uh, that milestone has been uh, crossed recently uh, thanks to the government which has uh, really pushed uh, everyone to get into this uh, account opening and all now the 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 second stage is okay no the now we have 50 50 crore plus jandan accounts what next so what next is uh, there are divided into three categories one is Uh, insure the un uninsured okay so the insurance is the biggest challenge especially in the again coming to the rural markets so lot of awareness is not there uh, and thanks to the government they are also working on this they are saying that by 2047 india should have everyone insured so we are uh, we are going to partner with the government on this soon we going to start a pilot project on this particular uh, line item and uh, we will be starting in up market uh the second thing is the financial uh, uh, loan access so that is also uh, the second thing which government is working on because rural is the huge and wide where the msme segments are there where if we fund a msme segment they will create a uh, employment in those rural markets itself so that you know the population will not migrate to the urban areas for seeking out any job opportunities now the third thing is the wealth management so which we are very keenly as i mentioned you know financial resilience uh, we'll be offering mutual funds we'll be offering not only fds etc no the mutual funds is what we going to build in in that product and uh, a- a- according to the customer uh, age bracket and kind of income sources kind of uh, uh, balances which they are maintaining basis that uh, through our a model we would be extending these services to them hope that answers any other questions hi uh so uh, because this is a discussion on platform i was also expecting some insight on oken and ondc okay uh, any insights from uh, private players on the government initiatives so yeah uh, ondc is a uh, talk of the market now right so it is a very good platform in fact you mentioned about oken as well right but uh, with ondc coming in to the picture right uh, these uh, oken uh, features are made available in ondc itself because uh, uh, you have you can sell insurance you can sell uh, loans you can sell anything i mean whatever uh, uh, you want to sell on ondc platform you can sell so it is a very good platform uh, widely accepted uh, uh, even for the e-commerce especially for the brands which are uh, like you know they are unable to expand right due to various constraint uh, could be because of the capital could be because of the marketing budgets etc and all so this platform is uh, uh, really evolving like anything and you know this we can say that you know another uh, uh, you know uh, upi kind of thing which we which we see in coming years in the country uh, right it's still at a early stage so the three key, key pillars for this is you know you know uh, the seller and the buyer applications plus the logistics so logistics is a uh, key challenge because uh, you have lot of platforms on the seller side right uh, because customer base is there for example paytm there are millions of users users are there on the uh, as a, uh, paytm so where the accessibility is also there and the reach is also pretty good even if you go to the rural markets you will find paytm sticker where you can make the payments and all but uh, logistics would be the biggest challenge because uh, uh, transporting the goods carrying the goods till the last mile especially in the rural markets so that would be the uh, challenge and uh, i think uh, the, there are certain companies which are working towards it like delivery and all uh, but uh, i think uh, that is one area if uh, someone can really focus on and smoothen this logistics maybe india post can get into this because 
postal services has got the largest network across the country right <coughs> they are the if you really look at you know they have the uh, very good reach in terms of uh, covering even the remote villages also where even the biggest largest network courier services companies are unable to cater so if if we can uh, uh, get those kind of uh, things into the logistics in place it will really help the brands especially the uh, which are uh, manufacturing side uh, be it a consumer goods or electronics cg or anything uh, even the fashion side of course there is a lot of uh, mishos etc they have been uh, working on this but uh, especially on the consumer goods side there is a lot of opportunity for the small small time players msmes they are currently catering only to the smaller geographies because of the expansion uh, enabled to expand and also the uh, there are some uh, traditional products which are available only in certain markets right like for example you know this uh, uh, kurumba we was you know tribal we have recently uh, done something with them so it's a very good art right they are, this art is uh, made on a jute bags uh, with all natural herbs the colors etc and all so these kind of uh, you know uh, Uh, products can be made available through the network of ondc which are which are cu currently not available anywhere because the cost of uh, uh, onboarding that particular service is not much margins are uh, pretty low there uh, for the uh, for the you know uh, uh, the manufacturer or the you know whoever is uh, creating these products otherwise if you have to go and uh, uh, list yourself in amazons and flipkarts of the world so they will be lost out in the uh, crores of products which are uh, being displayed over there and if you want to really come up to into the search engines the costs of advertising etc is pretty high so it's a good platform i think uh, it will uh, evolve uh, much and uh, as i mentioned it will become another upa kind of product and it is giving a, uh, the, this platform is giving opportunity for lot of small time players so th that's where they can uh, utilize this and uh, expand further one of the thing you know if you look at from a from your perspective as a financial institution right so i think ondc uh, is is going to help the entire ecosystem information out right that's one big thing if you look at it um uh, because right now let's say for example when we look at from a aa factor like account aggregation right so aggre account aggregation there is certain amount of data wherein you have bank information you have pan information you have got few other information that you can validate at one stop like integration but that data is yet to mature you know it's still going to take i mean they have made it very recently mandatory that everybody should be submitting it back also not only fetching the data right because everybody was very very uh, you know tight with their own data right uh now if you look at ondc also so you will be able to leverage on the ecosystem um, so let's say amazon would have like an the part of it that they will have like thousands and thousands of supplier what ajay has mentioned there is logistics there are a lot of other players so you will be able to have that visibility so today when you are doing a bill discounting you need to understand that whether the bill itself is genuine or not right um, the po is perfect or not so there are issues but when you are hooking it up in the future that's how we envisage and when you are hooking it up to the uh, ondc platform that integrity of the uh, flow of the information would be there so transparency would be there so you can take a much more informed decision as a financial institution to go about financing certain things or even creating a you know current account or few other things so the product uh, positioning is much better much stronger and you know much efficient actually in that case does that answer your question yeah thank you if there are no further questions uh you know we can draw the session to an end almost on time little bit over uh, but uh, so you know thank you uh, to all my panelists uh, for some very interesting nuggets that you guys have shared uh, thank you to the audience for being very patient uh, and also enthusiastic uh, i can rattle off a long list of learnings you know but the top 3 uh, you know that sort of stuck with me uh, number 1 is that dpdp you know please get your act together um then the fact that you know while we may talk about you know fully digital uh, digital is here to stay at least for the time being um and uh, you know it takes an ecosystem to reach financial services to the last mile how do we see more collaborations uh, amongst the various players one thing that you mentioned ajay also deeply resonated around 
uh, you know, having more female VC agents, you know, to service your women customers. Uh, one of the studies that uh, we launched, uh, you know, in partnership with IIM Ahmedabad, also had very strong data to confirm what you said. For every uh, in for every single digit, you know, increase in uh, female VCs, uh, the propensity of women to open and access accounts went up by 20x. So, um, you know, I just want to leave you with that statistic. Um, thank you, everyone. Hello. Uh, thank you so much uh, for a very uh, enriching discussion. And a special thank you to Priyanka for uh, brilliant moderation. And um, thank you so much, everyone, for your participation. Um, Priyanka has already sort of summarized, but I would like to quickly just few takeaways. Uh, there is a lot of work that needs to be done for enabling access to digital platforms for the last mile connectivity. The key takeaway is building a solution that is available, accessible, and affordable, which means designing tailor-made products for bottom of the pyramid, leveraging data for addressing the fraud and misinformation. Partnerships is the way forward with variety of stakeholders. And it is important to build a model for financial resilience and customer education to go hand in hand for moving from financial inclusion to true financial res resilience. So thank you so much. Yes. And uh, yes. So uh, I'm so sorry we had like almost one and a half hour to kind of you know uh, do this. But then because of the shortage of time and the sessions spilling over one another. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for your patience and for the patience of the audience. And uh, uh, we have a quick, uh, like a small token of appreciation for each one of you. Uh, so I would request Anshil to just. So thank you so much once again. And uh, I would also want to say that we have been doing uh, uh, live postings of these sessions. Uh, on our uh, different platforms. So uh, please like, share, and follow. And uh, I look forward to see you again. Uh, we would reconvene at 1.30 sharp for another very interesting uh, session, which is on women's empowerment through microfinance and microenterprise. So looking forward to seeing some of you again. Thank you so much. <laughs>